Hi, I'm Marcelo, a 56-year-old guy who decided midlife to switch careers after 30-plus years in the tech industry to filmmaking, pursuing a lifelong dream I had since my teenage years. I thought, if not now, then when? So follow me in my journey as I speak with other filmmakers all about how to make a living in filmmaking, the technologies we need to know, and how to tell a good story, and much more. So welcome to another episode of Transitioning to Filmmaking. <music> In today's episode, I'm having a conversation with Farooq Virani, TV editor and filmmaker, all about the art and craft of TV editing. But before we get started, if you're watching this on YouTube, remember to subscribe to my channel, click that bell icon to get notified when a new episode is out, hit that like button if you enjoyed this episode, and if you didn't, send me an email, marcelo at creativespark.ai and tell me why. Finally, remember to visit my site, creativespark.ai, for more podcast episodes, tutorials, and to read my daily journal, where I post how my transition to filmmaking is going. All right, let's bring on Farouk. Farouk, welcome to the podcast. Glad to have you here. Thanks for having me. Great, it's great to be here. Well, I met you at, uh, everybody knows because I'm very transparent of what I'm doing, switching from careers here from the tech industry, and I signed up at UCLA Extension, and uh, the, uh, the teacher in, in the class that I'm taking the art and craft of filmmaking, put a panel together. You were one of them there. And I was really inspired by your, your story and how you got into it. Um, and you know, thank you for agreeing to be here and, uh, to talk a little bit more about the art and craft of, uh, film editing. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, that was a great class. And, um, I'm thankful to one of my mentors, Mitch Danton. He, he invited me to this panel and he gathers, gathers a lot of great editors to discuss in that class. So. Uh, thanks. And thanks for this follow-up conversation. Oh yeah, definitely. It's going to be fun. I mean, we're going to get to watch some clips and almost a continuation of that class actually. So yeah. why don't we start with, uh, your background, how, you know, what inspired you to get into editing? Um, I think maybe like a lot of people, well, not a lot of people, but I mean, at least for me, I think in, um, high school, you know, if I had the opportunity to use my parents home camcorder, uh, to make a class project or, um, uh, you know, submit something for English class and, and make a short film. Um, we, we, we took every chance we can, we could get me and my classmates, um, acting in it, uh, doing some very bad, uh, costume and production design. Um, but I think that was all, you know, the sort of, um, you know, VCR to VCR sort of editing. But, um, one of my first friends, uh, I think it was senior year of high school. You know, it was when he was one of the first people to have a, a very early version of Adobe Premiere. And, um, uh, that was like, yeah big change for me. I was like, oh, you know, I can control um, timing a lot more precisely, volume of music, um, bring in some titling and effects and things. And um, um, anyhow, that 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 was a, a big change for me. And um, yeah, I decided to apply to film school. I, I also um, was thought com uh, computer engineering might be my, my path oh. towards a career. And so okay. I, I, I was admitted to uh, some undergrad programs in uh, computer engineering. But um, sort of on a whim, I, I applied to a film school. And um, I think when I got in, I, I thought it was a sign that maybe it's something I should pursue. But I, I didn't know it was going to be my career path. But I just knew that um, I, I wanted to do something technical, but also marry that with the creative interests. Um, so, so yeah, you're technically inclined, then obviously, if you're a computer, you would go into computer engineering. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think in school, I took a class where we like learned in high school, I took a class where we learned C++. And um, oh. I, 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 yeah, I was sort of heading that direction. But um yeah, if there was some, and I think I took one of those sort of career assessment surveys in high school and um, yeah, media communications, it's sort of where I landed. And um, yeah, I took that to heart and um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad I, I could have sort of continued on this path. And I, I do think editing is kind of the place where all that comes together for me. And I, I was on newspaper and yearbook and in, in uh, high school as well. I took some theater classes, but anyway, this sort of brought together a lot of things. And um, I, I think, um, I feel most comfortable in terms of uh, editing in the, in the creative process. Yeah, definitely. Well, they're both very creative, right? Even computer engineering for a programming is very, it's a very creative endeavor. Um, not every programmer programs the same way. And just like every editor doesn't edit the same way with the same footage, right? Yeah, totally. You're, you're building something, you're generating something from an empty timeline or I guess an empty uh, set of code. Um, yeah. And it's not, it's, I think maybe we were talking about a little earlier before this, but, um, you know, satisfying to see something come together and uh, 
see all the technical aspects work in, in harmony to create a story that uh, people can follow. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Now you were mentioning before we, we were talking before the recording started about being an AE and how you enjoyed that. Um, uh, did you start as an AE and then progress into TV? How did you How did you go from your Premiere Pro editing that you were talking about that you did to working in in scripted TV now? Oh, um, yeah. I think uh, maybe similar to some, to some other editors or filmmakers' paths. Um, I sort of took on anything I could, um, mm. and that that included um, out out of undergrad film school. I was doing. Um, you know, corporate videos, uh, commercials, uh, music videos, wedding videos, um, pretty much anything. But at, at that time, I was sort of, you know, there, it was sort of the um, videographer editor or the sort of predator position where you're producer, video, mm -hmm. videographer, editor. You know, they, they just wanted people who could do a little bit of everything. So I bought a Canon camera. I, I was um, shooting, um, editing my own footage in Premiere. And then eventually, I think um, Final Cut Pro 7 and uh, Final Cut Pro 7, uh, I know for a lot of people, it was just very comfortable. And it was a solid program. I mean, it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You could just make it do what you want it to do. And it's very intuitive. Um, I think like really crashed on me. Um, so yeah, uh, that that was sort of my start. But um, doing a variety of different types of programming, nonprofit, short documentaries. Um, so I was sort of like editing from the beginning, but I didn't really think of it as editing. I was just like, we need, we need this piece done. Will you do it? And I was like, OK. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, then I started getting more formal in my career path, I um, was an assistant editor on a reality show for two years about an ESPN reality show. And um, that was great because um, all the sort of technical skills I had been kind of developing unofficially, you know, working on my own independent projects, um, you know, I was digitizing the the DV footage they were shooting or um, uh, so I, I had those skills digitize, digitizing into Final Cut Pro. Um, so as an assistant editor, and then they found out that I could also edit um and, and uh within this uh show there was um high school football uh, it was featuring kind of competitive high school football teams across the nation mm -hmm. and um so they needed somebody to sort of do quick three minute cut downs or like a highlight reel of the last last week's big football game or last week's friday night big football game and uh, so i had the ability to do that through these little like highlight packages and um yeah it was good to like have come in with a bit of a, a tool set and um jump jump right in so um yeah anyhow uh, that was all sort of final cut pro based i remember learning in avid and in, in, in undergrad but avid sort of that knowledge sort of disappeared and um I, I knew i was around texas and atlanta for some of these jobs uh I'm, I'm originally from texas and then i spent some time in atlanta where my sister lives um but i knew i wanted to head west and try to be in la mm -hmm. um i think i was a little scared to just dive right in um so i, I chose to go to graduate film school at usc um, I, I knew there'd be a cost involved, uh, student loan payments, but, um, you know, I, I told my parents that this was kind of the next step for my career. And, um, yeah, I, I think being able to kind of brush up on technical skill sets within an academic setting, uh, where there's like a little bit of safe space to like try things out and make some mistakes. Um, also build a really great professional network, um, great faculty, all, all with professional experience. Um, those were all great. And I think I spent three years there. Um, my third year, I was finishing a thesis film. Uh, as a director, I, I also sort of write and direct as a hobby, but editing has been my main uh, space for building a craft and a career. Um, but anyhow, that, that that being said, my third year at USC, um, I was uh, I took a documentary course, and um, the documentary faculty was really kind to me, and they gave me my first start as an assistant editor on a documentary well, while I had one foot in school and was like heading into the real world. So it was really great to get that experience. Um, and um, that was actually a Fallen Code Pro documentary. Um, but it was like, maybe the last one I did. <laughs> but um, Final Cut 7. That's correct, yes. Um, but but yeah, we, we, we learned Avid in school. And um, it was good to get a refresher and like um, through cutting like a lot of short films while in school, you know, um, each film presented a new question or challenge and you kind of dive into the Avid toolbox and be like, how do I do this? And what's the best way to handle this effect? Or, um, so each project, I think I learned something from. So and I still look at short films as a great place to. Yeah, we're going to yeah. talk about that. Because even though with the success you have on TV, you're still doing a lot of short films. So which I find very interesting. Um, did you find you said you were in reality TV doing assist editing? Do you find that 
to get into scripted TV, that's a great way to start. Uh, did that help you? Did that hurt you? Meaning like, you know, was, is it totally different than what you end up doing? Oh yeah. And I think it's like, yeah, even though in theory, they're different creative workflows and paths, um, just the, the rigor of reality TV and, and all the different challenges you face. Yeah. I feel like it prepares you for everything. Cause th then you really have to like, not go under the hood of the avid or the or premiere, but really try to see the best way to handle a GoPro is along with, um, I don't know, airy footage. Um, so yeah, and you have stacks of like tons and tons of footage. So the variety of cameras, I mean, you're learning all sorts of formats and obviously the, with that comes tons of challenges. Yeah, 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 grouping, you know, whether or not you have good time code, you know, usually they try to Brain. sync and have good jam time code, but you know, a lot of times you'd have camera A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and maybe camera G doesn't, was not synced in time code for the day and you're like where does this fit in the shooting <laughs> shooting timeline of the day anyway but yeah you, you you really like you know um and i also have to ask a lot of questions to other assistant editors other people around like what's the best way to handle this um yeah through trial or error and error i think i learned a lot and then my close a close friend and mentor um it also towards the end of my graduate school time i, I was a uh sort of interning or a production assistant at a um documentary company um the director uh greg barker he came into one of our documentary classes and uh his, his work the, the film he showed and his work just really resonated with me in terms of the content and subject matter and um yeah i asked him after the class if, if he was looking for any additional post-production help that's kind of where i was headed and um yeah they, they let me come in a couple of days a week into their production office and um so yeah the 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 first assistant editor on the documentary they're working on at the time um yeah, I, I would check in with him because, you know, I had sort of the, you know, academic school experience, but then there's also the real world, like, how do we actually deliver this documentary? And that documentary ha had a lot of um, archival YouTube footage. It, it was all about um, the Arab Spring and uh, being on the ground and that access. And um, yeah, they're getting shipped footage on hard drives from like Syria and Libya. And then those were in, those were in you know, pal or different formats anyway, but, but yeah, I, I was, I was checking in with him a lot and I was like, how, how would you handle this? And how would you handle that? And he was very generous with his knowledge. And, um, yeah, again, that was sort of like, um, yeah, learning, learning on the job and, and, uh, it, it was, it was him, uh, uh, Tuan who, um, the editor or assistant editor who, who moved on to editing, who, uh, sort of encouraged me or re reiterated to me that this this documentary experience I was gaining, he was like, this this can translate to a career in scripted. He's like, you can handle, um, you can handle these challenges. He's like, it's it's a different set of challenges in, in scripted. He's like, but you can, even if you don't think you can, you can handle scripted. So right, yeah, right. So then, how did you go from that to now to TV, or or was there something else in between that? Uh, no, I, I did a couple of years of documentary work, and I thought that's where I wanted to be. I, I found. Um, the process of seeing a documentary come together, even though it's like a long process, it, mm -hmm. it was really re rewarding if you're on a documentary for a uh, year, two years, three years, um, uh, you know, you're, you're in it and, um, and so many different iterations of the film and to see all that finally reach a final cut was always very satisfying. But um, yeah, it was towards the end of um, a documentary that um, my mentor encouraged me to uh, get on the union roster because uh, that, mm -hmm. that documentary gave me uh, the required assistant editor hours and qualifications and credits. Um, so yeah, so I joined the union. Uh, I was on the union roster. I, I didn't necessarily have a union job lined up, but um, I, I was ready in case something came along. And um, uh, yeah, that that same editor provided me my first sort of scripted opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it required him to sort of vouch for me and, and let let the producers know on that scripted show that. Um, uh, I, I was ready to assist edit on, on a TV show and, and I did about, um, yeah, I, I came into the edit suite a couple times to, um, you know, get up to speed on Avid, but also Avid, how Avid, the way to use the tools for scripted, uh, how to prep dailies, you know, what, what to consider, um, once we have, um, an episode edit, um, what to, what to, uh, be prepared for once we're locked to turn over to, um, other vendors, color correction, sound mix. Anyway, so it was like, it was like a nice little boot camp. I mean, it was sort of like, I guess, a, a mini master of the workflow, pre master of the workflow, <laughs> but, 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 but it was that, it was that flavor of like a workshop, sure. but you know, it was just my friends who were put, putting me through that. So, um, I appreciated that, that, uh, sharing of knowledge. So.
That's awesome. So how many years do you think passed from you, not the VHS part, but you hitting Premiere Pro, that was your first sort of NLE, right, right there, to when you got to uh, TV editing? 10 years. 10 years, okay. Yeah. The reason I ask is because it feels like when you spoke and even when you spoke in class, it feels like it, your success came very quickly, but I wanted to point out that it feels quickly, but it really wasn't, right? It took took a lot of work and a lot of you doing a lot of stuff, right? 10 years is, I wouldn't call it super quick. It's very fast, but it's super nice, right? It's a lot of work. I just want to point that out, that it takes work to get to to this kind of point, correct? Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I think there was a lot of... um. Yeah, different experiences along the way, different NLEs, uh, handling different camera formats. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and at times, like, I wasn't sure how I was going to fit into the industry. Um, um, but yeah, and I think taking the plunge to move out to LA was it was good for me. I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I mean, I know Atlanta's um, television industry is, bur is burgeoning too, but um, I think in terms of post production, there's like uh, a lot more opportunities here. here. Um, but yeah, no, totally. I, I think I, I, you've put in the hours and I'm still learning. So uh, still growing. So yeah. That's awesome. And you have that kind of attitude too that um, you you seem to always want to learn something new and you're open with everybody and, and you share your your knowledge, which is something that, that I think that's probably part what what made you succeed too is the personality, right? It's being able, being, being, open to sharing and, and open to pretty much everything. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, sort of just, uh, landing around, uh, kind, uh, collaborators and, and coworkers. Um, yeah. I just kind of absorb that and try to do the same. I think it was on my, my first credit for scripted union uh, work was, uh, I zombie for the CW. And I think that that post-production team, uh, Tuan, Viet, John, um, yeah, they're just like, it was just a great team, um, great assistant editors. And um, yeah, everybody was like really open to, you know, poke their head into somebody else's office and be like, oh, what are you, what are you working on? And like, um, yeah, in like a generous way, like, oh, I, like if I'm doing some sound mix or something, they're like, oh, you know, you might want to try this with your tracks or something. And um, that that kind of flow of knowledge just, um, it was easy. And um, when I was an assistant editor, the, the, that group of editors, they all sort of tried to prepare me for a possible career or possible bump in editing. Um, so um, yeah, in my in my downtime, not downtime. I mean, being, there, it, 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 assistant editor's day was was very busy. But but if I had time, in your off time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. If I had time early in the day, or like if I stayed after a little bit, I, um, my editor let me cut a scene or two, and that I would show him the scenes the next day, get his feedback. Um, yeah, and you keep kind of growing in that way and showing them that I'm sort of learning the format of the show, learning more about mm -hmm. uh, the, the pace and rhythm of TV editing. Um, and, uh, yeah, that, that was sort of, at some point, maybe they, I feel like they thought maybe my skill set was ready and there happened to be an opening on the show and, um, yeah, I, 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 the producers gave me a, gave me a shot. So, so now you're at the CW, uh, you did iZombie, you're currently doing Walker, right? Yes. Um, so why don't we watch a clip, then we can talk a little bit about the style and go through that. Um, you tell me, do you want the bank robbery, the gun shootout, or the truck heist? Oh, maybe we do a little bit of the truck heist, yeah. All right, let's do that. Let's, uh, we'll play it, and then we'll come back right after and chat about it. Dashing through the snow open sleigh over the fields we go laughing all the way bells on bobtail ring making spirits bright what fun it is to laugh and sing a sleighing song tonight oh, jingle bells jingle bells jingle Hey. 
Three Riverview Place, Wichita Falls. Up out the truck, or that's gonna be our next stop. We know your family's there. Tick tock. Merry Christmas, Thomas Serrano. That was awesome. Great. So let let's start with uh, like music. Did, did you is did you did you choose the music? Or did you have temp music first? And um, also, did you did you use the music to help you cut it? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, music was an important part. And, and, and apologies to anyone listening to a podcast. You may have heard some epic right, music. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, Thank you for it. mentioning that. <laughs> <laughs> Than I am, man. <laughs> but yeah, no, no. I, um, I, I assure the people listening on the podcast that uh, there was some great editing and, and uh, you know, and timing with the music. Um. <laughs> there was exactly, exactly. But but they got to come back and watch it. That's why. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Incentive to visit the uh, video version. Yeah, um, yeah, no, totally. Um, this was, uh, I think it was episode two hundred six. Uh, Douglas Fur, you know, sort of our holiday episode. Um, so yeah, we have a great music supervisor in uh, Austin. The film also shoots. I mean, the the show shoots in Austin. And then we have a music supervisor based in Austin. And I feel like he's got his finger on the pulse of um, great um, Austin musicians, Austin independent uh, labels. Um, so yeah, he, he'll feed us um, a, uh, a folder of music every episode. And, and for this one, being the holiday episode, he, he uh, had a lot of great um, sort of twangy country um, holiday covers. And um, growing up in Texas, I don't know, I'm a fan of country music. So it was great to go, th go through those. and. Um, that, that 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 opening piece you know it's like obviously supposed to be sort of a sleepy texas town right and then um transitioning to something um high energy so um yeah th i thought that was a great cue and and um it was fun the, the the pieces that the director shot also sort of dictated that the um kind of like almost like a tumbleweed but the spinning kind of a christmas mm -hmm. ribbon ribbon and things and anyway so just just using those visual cues and, and trying to make it line up with the music um and um uh yeah i thought that, that, that was uh, hopefully worked and successful and then um a um yeah we tried to do something where i forget it was i think we did a little sting when we reveal the truck pursuing uh the lead car uh for the heist and mm -hmm. uh, and um yeah i think the in, 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 uh, the final in the final composition i, I used temp music but we use, we use temp music from our composers pre-existing library okay. uh, from season one early season two. Um, but yeah, so we used a previous cue and then but I think in the final uh, composition, I think he, he did something to try to use the same kind of chords or, 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 or um, uh, tone. Like he tried to transition out of that Christmas song in a way. But I think we also had some like um, sound effects to sort of um, trigger yeah, it. to do that transition. Yeah. 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 To cut off the previous song and, or music and go to the next one. Um, but when you went from temp to the final music piece, did you have to uh, resync some of the beats? Because you're you're cutting to some of the beats, right? So did you have to like go and finesse the edit a bit or did the musician try to compose it to what you cut? Uh, yeah, well, for the uh, for the Christmas song in the beginning, um... Uh, since we were licensing that uh, needle drop um yeah that, that was able to stay as is um okay. and uh, the music edit if we did make a music edit in there i think we might have and then the um uh, composed song yeah I, I think we we had sort of shifted around the cue from our composer the cue from our previous episode um i think he tried to try to match that and um but, but i think he he obviously i think um tailored it even better and and, and uh, improved on that where um if we're revealing, you know, um, certain things where the, the thugs get out of the car, or, um, uh, the hits. Um, yeah. So I think he, he accented those and stung those even better. So, um, anyway, we, we tried to do that where we're like, at least we, um, as, as a guide in our, in our music edit of his cue, we, um, tried to hit the main points that we thought were dramatically interesting, but, um, yeah, no, I, I think he definitely plus plus on that. And I think as usual, the composer, um, uh, helped kind of stitch together all the sort of dramatic beats we were going to, we were trying to hit. Right, right. So guide us through the process of you, you get all this footage, and I'm assuming they already come, the dailies are already set up for you and everything, right? either through your assist or through a, a post house or something. Just guide us through that process. Like, how do you, how do you build that scene? 
um, like, do you start with the script and just do a cut straight from what the script says and then do your thing or like guide us through that process? Uh, yeah, uh, I guess um, this was sort of um, uh, an interesting uh, scene to build because um, it's an action scene. Um, it's a great uh, sort of car pursuit scene. Um, but yeah, I guess different from a dialogue scene, there's a little bit of room to play. Um, but I definitely let the footage be a guide on, um, on Walker. We shoot, uh, three cameras, uh, typically ABC camera. Um, and the, ca the show typically has a handheld style. So we'll have three grouped cameras and, um, I'm working from those and, uh, my assistant will group those. And, um, yeah, I try to watch the dailies with the three groups up in this case, it was, uh, well, there, there's three group cameras for the part where the thugs get out of the truck and then, um, salt the uh mm -hmm. in the truck um but uh yeah so but prior to that i think there were sort of specific cameras that were isolated there was like a um a, the um the camera pursuit car you know the what is the hydro crane uh, that that sort of truck with the right. crane on it so that, that was sort of like the i guess the hero camera so I, I looked at that first and just tried to identify like the most interesting and dynamic parts that the director was trying to shoot with that i, I used that as the uh guide and those sort of built the pieces and, and, and told the story of, um, I guess, the geography of the um, truck pursuit. So I, I used that first. And then um, uh, then we had like GoPros mounted um, on like wheel wells and other places. And then cameras inside the car with um, uh, the gentleman who's uh, about to be robbed um, or his truck is about to be robbed. Um, so, yeah. So, the, so then I, then we kind of, yeah, uh, getting down, I guess, the geography of where the cars are, who's, who's gaining on who, when they overtake him. Um, trying to tell that story with with the, the um, crane footage and, and some of the um, oh then, then there's also just some kind of cameras sort of mounted alongside the road. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, so trying to tell that story first, and then um, and then peppering in, not peppering in. I mean, in concert with that, um, if there were cameras on, on the drivers, you know, when when they're uh, reacting to uh, the dramatic points, um, it, once he realizes that he's. Um, uh, yeah, he, he's, he's in some trouble uh, trying to stick with that that delivery driver um, and hit those major points. So I, I did like one first pass where I thought it was good, um, you know, and I, I tried to um, show all the all the shifts in the action dynamically, um, and it played. But then you know we showed the director and um, they wanted to. I think they, well, yeah, they, it, it was it was long at getting down that that dirt road. So so we we, we made it shorter. Um, and then we also tried to like, um, find opportunities to make it even more dynamic. And, and some, a lot of times it was in the GoPros that sort of was sort of last place I went, but, um, it was great to kind of see if I remember, you know, um, dirt kicking off some of those tires, some skids, um, and getting, getting that close, uh, dynamic detail, uh, shots. So, yeah, so, so, so moving some of those in and, and then my, my assistant too, he, he went through and sort of combed through the GoPro and, and found some of the best selected, um, cool moments to, to feature, um, so yeah, it was a series, I guess, of like, yeah, yeah, build, build, tell, telling the story of the the, the the two trucks, and then 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 really building in additional energy and additional. And it seemed like the pacing really sped up at at the cut of the second music, right? When when the truck comes forward, and that's when the pacing really kicked in, and and your edit reflected that, right? You started cutting faster and more angles. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then as as they approach on. Um, uh, really holding him captive, we, we got faster, and then um, and then, but then of course, there's also featured uh, special shots like and and then those for sure, we were like that's got to go in where there's like a sort of a dynamic push in where you see one of the one of the thugs. It's sort of I guess a homage to Point Break where they have these reindeer masks for the holidays though in this episode. But anyway, there's like one like really dramatic push in on, on one of the gentlemen where he mm -hmm. skids his car out, and um, yeah, that that shot I was like we got we got to put that in. So anyway, building around the shots that I think are like are for sure, the director has has made it clear that these going to be uh special hero angles and then um yeah build, building around those and but yeah i i think i found that um you know even, even though like i thought i had a good pace you can always push the pace a little bit more but still still tell the story and, and show the beats um so yeah it, it was just like versions and iterations of um mm -hmm. try, try, trying to you know push the gas down on, on the pedal of, of this uh, chase even more um so yeah that, that was great and um uh yeah that's something i i sort of challenge myself to do on the show since we, we do we do we, we have had opportunities to um you know uh I mean, most of the time each episode has a great kind of action set piece 
was a car chase explosion. We, we had a car flip and I think we had, well, yeah, I think I had an episode where a truck flip or like an 18 wheeler flipped. And I think I had another one where a truck flipped. Um, anyway, but those are great. And then like they practically did those um, with like multiple cameras on it. So um, it's great to have those opportunities. And we're, but we're doing it, you know, in terms of network TV, we have a compressed editing timeline and delivery time. I was going to ask you, so how long, what's the turnaround uh, on an episode? Or even let's say on the scene, right? Because uh, do, do you pass it on to your, do you pass the entire episode to the director or do you do it scene by scene and get notes? Uh, I guess might be different on different shows, but on, on our show, the, the director will typically watch the final full episode. The full episode. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Our, our sort of editor's cut. And um, obviously we try to polish that and um, fill it out with music and sound effects as best as possible to sell um, sell the story, to sell mm -hmm. the drama, sell the action. Um, but um, yeah, in this case, you, you know, we film eight days and, or, or this was an eight day episode. Some some episodes have, have shorter shoot days depending on schedules, but this was an eight day shoot, meaning uh, I got eight days to edit the dailies. And then we had two days after that to um, sort of further prepare the editor's cut and get it ready for the director. So I guess within 10 days, this was built. But um, yeah, I, I, I um, I guess it changes episode to episode. Sometimes I know I, I can get through some of the, some of the dialogue scenes in in, in the show, or um, uh, um, you know. But but I knew this one would be like a little bit of a a thing to a bear to build. But um, anyway, but I kept I kept looking at it. I, I would sort of like just make selects. I'd go back to it, make some selects, work on a dialogue scene, go back to it. Um, but I think trying to take it on all at once for for me was a little uh, it's sometimes overwhelming to to build an action scene all at once. But I think every time I go back to it. I have a new idea or see something else great. And um, either between me or my assistant, we'll, we'll both try to, you know, identify the, the great pieces to put put in there uh, if, if, it's, if it is an action or a chase scene. Um, so what kind of tricks did you use to uh, pick up the pace, to slow down the pace? I mean, are you cutting frames out to make it faster? You know, like what, what are the tricks uh, that you use to to make it an exciting scene like that, especially like a chase scene or or a fight? Oh yeah, I mean, in this case, I think it was mostly as is. I think we might have sped up a few shots, uh, just just a hair, um, if it felt like the, the cars were moving a bit slower. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, that was yeah, barely. Uh, we didn't want it to start looking like fake action um, right. or or too too um, artificial. But um, yeah, that that was sort of minor. But yeah, in, in terms of fight scenes, um, that's something I'm continuing to work on too. I think. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm tempted in my first cut. Well, not tempted to. I mean, it makes sense in my first pass on a fight scene to, you know, show all the geography for, for the fight to make sense. Okay, this person swings. Then this person blocks. Then the, this person kicks the other person. And you want to, like, at least for my, my satisfaction, I, I saw every, you know, uh, piece of the choreographed fight as intended. Um, but, but I feel like I need to put that in for the editor's cut. And then often with the, with the director, um, then, then we have the opportunity and... Um, in the creative collaboration with the director to, um, yeah, get a little bit more, um, in other words, like staccato or like, you know, you can like get a little bit more choppy with the action, you know, like I don't have to see, um, every bit of like winding up for a punch. And sometimes you're just feeling like impacts and those can be in quicker rhythm and, and flurry. And that's something I continue to work on, but it's, I think it's like sort of scene by scene dependent on the stunt choreography. Um, but but I am trying to trying to sort of um, take a little bit more liberty in like how, how you creatively experience a fight. You, you know, it's because because there there's kind of a rhythm to the violence where um, when you sort of intensify um, the rhythm and, and cut out not not they're cutting out time, but like you said, like maybe taking out frames, speeding up right. swings. Um, uh, yeah, and, and I don't know. I guess it varies. I mean, sometimes yeah, sometimes the choreography plays out well and like one one two shot and like you just want to see the fight choreography but often i think ours are sort of more of a assembly of punches uh re receiving those punches reactions um sort of assembling a fight in that way but i try we try to keep it dynamic and um, interesting and we have a great stunt team over there there's a stunt double for walker uh who looks i mean as he should be he looks a lot like walker <laughs> so, uh, but but what walker i mean the, the actor jared padalecki who plays walker he'll he'll do some of his own stunts um, but every now and then, I mean, a lot of times his, his stunt double will come in mm -hmm. and take some of the falls and hits. Yeah. Um, but they, they give us plenty to work with and um, build, building a fight scene. I think, I don't know, 
sometimes I'm intim intimidated to dive into those. Um, but, uh, but then I realized that, you know, you, you, cause you have, you get a lot more coverage. Um, you know, if, if, you know, in a, if in a dialogue scene, I'm getting, um, I don't know, um, from shot 24A to 24G, um, in a fight scene, I might get, you know, from piece of coverage, uh, you know, 25 to 25Z in terms of pieces of coverage. Um, but, but each, you know, each piece, when you break it down, it's like, yeah. It's it's not as intimidating. It's just like oh, this is for the punch. This is for the kick. Oh, this is for the end. Uh, this is the part where they they dive away from the explosion. Anyway, so but yeah, building it like a puzzle uh, chronologically. Um, I just sort of. Um, but that implies great organization, right? I guess either on your end or on your assist. Uh yeah, yeah. Zen, my uh, partner assistant. Um, he uh, yeah. Sometimes we'll put it in. Um, I think I think he'll go through sometimes and just put it in fight order. Where even though you know twenty five x is like actually top of the scene, it, it, you know, so like we'll, we'll put it in. Um, so in the in the avid bin, I can kind of see the flow of the scene, the flow of the coverage, and um, yeah, it's easier to take on that way, um, sort of building forward. Um, but um, but I, yeah, I don't always build from top to bottom of fight scenes. Sometimes um, if I know, you know, I think we had a boat fight, and I think um, somebody throws somebody off the boat. Anyway, so 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 that that I was like, oh, this is a key moment. Let me let me build around the uh, uh, flipping the person off the boat and the splash. Let me make that look really great. And then before that, there's some struggling. And then I kind of worked backwards. Anyway, it's different scene to scene, but um, I I don't I don't know if I edit in a conventional way or sometimes I uh, get a little anxiety about a, a big a big scene. But but I find ways to like you know find my way in and find my way to like uh, parse it out. Yeah. How important is sound effects, let's say on a, on a fight scene, right? Because if you, if you watch any really, really cool fight scene, you take the sound out then, and, and you watch what they shot, sometimes it's not as cool, right? So how, how, how much do you depend on the sound effects for you to, to get the feel of that fight? Uh, yeah, it's, it's very important. I, I think, um, I, yeah. So, so that being said, like, I will try to build the action scenes as, as quickly as possible, even though like I'm, I'm sort of building over the course of dailies, like the, the sooner yeah. I can, I can get it to, uh, uh, an assistant editor, um, to start building in sound. Cause when I was an assistant editor too, it was great to have those fight scenes and have time to, um, build out the sound effects. And, um, uh, yeah, cause like, cause I, then if I can like, as an assistant editor myself, when I was, you know, if I can show the editor, the scene built with sound effects, you're right. Like then they might adjust it because like they want those punches to be like pop, pop, pop or something, you know, pretty, right. a particular rhythm and like, oh, okay, let me, if I take a few frames off the end of the shot. Um, but, um, but yeah, we, we, we took, uh, I don't know, I, I, but I think we like built some templates um, early in season one, but obviously we handle it different episode to episode, but um, I think we take pride in like um, trying to make our temp punches like good, like layering like three sounds, you know, for like a little bit of like, crunchiness a little bit of um flesh like pound and then um maybe a little bone crunch in there too or anyway but like to make make every punch really mm -hmm. like sound good even if it's temp and and i think our uh, hopefully the writers producers directors executive producers watching the episodes like it helps them give a get a feel for like what the potential is in the final mix and um yeah i, I mean um same thing with our gunshots we, we try to like um seem like they play in the, in the in the space in the environment correctly with um if we're doing like a little tiny bit of a temp reverb or um, ricochets or, or things, I mean, as, as much as we can. So sometimes we have to do like a simple representation of the sound, but, but it is a challenge. Like when I, um, when I go in and have to sort of recut timing uh, on a fight scene and then uh, the, uh, the assistant editor has to kind of jump, adjust sound effects accordingly. That's always like a little bit of a shifting weird dance, but, um, but I try for the most part, if I'm trimming or changing a fight scene to keep, keep the sound effects in sort of the same place so it doesn't get mm -hmm. too messy and gnarly in the timeline. Um, and sometimes it's easier just kind of like, I understand just pull, pull out all the sound effects if I'm, if I'm doing a, a kind of a recut with a director, but um, as much as possible, I try to keep that assistant editor's work or, or maybe our, our joint sound work within the timeline. Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, why don't we watch the, uh, um, I think it's the bank heist. Is that what it is? I think so. Yeah. Or yeah, um, the, the bank robbery. Sorry, the bank robbery. Right, uh, that one. So I'm gonna play that one, and because that one is interesting, because there's a lot of uh, there's definitely a lot of coverage in that, and I want to talk through that. So let's play that one, and then we'll be right back. Down the brass tacks, 
Pardon me, ma'am. It's gonna be fine, okay? Stay calm. I'm gonna need you to empty those registers in the front. Tell your manager to hand over the payroll bag from the vault. Chris, payroll bag, vault. Right now. There we go. <laughs> Steady there, old timer. Uh uh. Uh uh. Everybody stay cool. Give me a favor. Carefully take up that boomstick. Kick it my way. There we go. Yep. Ma'am, you may proceed as direct. All right, folks, why don't we lie on the ground, take a load off for a few. That's right, you've earned it. Ain't nothing wrong with a little siesta. This one's loaded. Mm. How are you doing, pal? Can be better. Chris, look at that. That was Daytona 500 pit stop fast, Chris. Thank you kindly. Hey, why don't you give her a day off after all this? Okay, well, we sure do appreciate the hospitality. Me and my hostess must be on our way now. Y'all take care. You mind showing us the back door out? No. Oh, Shadow High tailed it, but we gotta move. Well, it's a good thing your best friend also happens to be a wheelman. Awesome. Um, for those that are listening, another great edit. Come watch it because otherwise you missed out. But um, one thing I'm impressed is you really did a really good job on the edit side for orienting the viewer of where this is happening, especially like at the beginning, right? I have sort of have the video open here to go through, but I mean, establishing where we're at, the location, both external and in internal, right? Once we're in there. So then when, when you start cutting back and forth and doing close-ups, the viewer isn't disoriented. They know exactly where they're located. Even when they leave and get into the car and you've got the wide shot of the entire location. I mean, it just, to me, it felt like it's a, it was like the whole cut really put me in the middle of this and I knew exactly where I was all the time. Oh, that's great to hear. Yeah, yeah. No, I, was and that I, by design? Uh, yeah, yeah. And I, um, the great director I was working with us on, on this episode, um, yeah, he, he definitely uh ensure that all those visual pieces were there to, to tell the story because um that's a lot of coverage they did yeah this is three cameras as well uh yeah maybe even a fourth one oh uh, yeah depending on the scene um but yeah in this case um quick uh, synopsis of the scene which which helped inform the editing um yeah walker is um being forced by an ex-con to um uh rob a bank um, and then, then his, some of his loved ones will be freed. So he's, his, his, his loved ones are captive. Um, if he robs this bank, um, you know, his family will go free. So the gentleman out front in the truck is, a another thug who's been telling them, um, I think he refers to him at the end as our, our shadow. So it's basically somebody who's shadowing him. So yeah, there's specific pieces, you know, like a push in on, on that, that thug watching them. And, and we tried to like show that where that thug is in his relation through the glass doors. Um, of the bank at the beginning to, mm -hmm. to to get a sense of the distance and to get a sense that he, you know, he's close enough in proximity to like know what they're doing. Um, but um, yeah, it was it was great. I mean, it was great to have all the pieces to to um, establish geography, sort of blocking all the what's at stake. Um, yeah, and I think we just tried to use um, all those great pieces of coverage and obviously the actors' great performances in turn because I think they hopefully within this bank heist, you know, play the stakes that um, this is not something Walker wants to do. It's not, not something he's comfortable doing, but he's, he's going through the motions, but you know, they're, they're both kind of playing roles within the roles cause they're, they're pretending. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so um, that was fun to play with. Well, and during the robbery itself, um, you cut really fast there between like close ups instead of just having, just showing them as a, as a, you know, a white shot and you, you really get in and do a fast cutting there. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And again, I think, um, uh, credit to the director for getting like, um, or, or guide, guiding me with specific inserts, you know, and like, mm -hmm. 
if there's a close up of a gun against somebody's, you know, waist, you know, I, I know that that's like, okay, that's like going to heighten the threat of the gun and, and make this feel like a real, um, even though it's a sort of a, a play within the two of them, like a farce, a farce of a robbery, you know, like trying to make the stakes feel real ish. And, the, and then the reactions from the, um, you know, again, I guess they're like day player actors, but uh, the, the people behind the counter too, like, it seems like they're, they're playing the stakes well enough to make it feel like everybody is buying this as, as a legitimate robbery. Um, everybody in the bank is scared. And, um, you know, we, we did. Yeah. And so like, yeah, if, if it was there in the dailies and if it, if, if it, um, if it looked great and if it guided the story, we, 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 we tried to include it all and, and but keep the pace up and, um, you know, cut, cut being sure to like clock the actors, uh, at key moments along the scene. And I think, uh, um, I think there's like a definitely like a really nice, if I remember a good steady cam shot in the middle where it sort of arcs around, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Hoyt, his sort of accomplice and he's got his gun and, you know, the, the, using those sort of like, um, moments to sort of hit and articulate in the middle of the cut is like, okay, well, I know this is going in and it's just like an epic hero shot, you know, to so put it in. And, um, yeah, we also did like a little bit of visual effects in there. I think, um, my, minor stuff, but, um, because this is the episode it, it all takes place in the course of a day where um his his family is basically um uh taken hostage uh he has to rob this bank he goes home in the evening um and then they um drop off the money and they actually like um end up killing the ex-con who put them up for this um anyhow but yeah so the time of day on the clock on the wall like it didn't make sense in terms of where this was happening in the timeline so we changed the clock um and then there was also some um uh extra oh, so that clock was vfx i mean it was changed later because it was different yeah 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 so just, just to make sense in terms of the timeline of the day mm -hmm. and then um yeah there's some actors in the in extras in the background who weren't really playing uh, i don't know the reactions and the stakes uh, to make it feel like a legitimate robbery so we, i think we removed or asked the vfx team to remove some of the extras and that was actually uh, there's like a funny vfx shot because we, we like well we we send them over to the vfx team along with the note you know like and we were like well right you know remove background extra um i think we had like pointed it out or usually we circle like who we're talking to but anyway when we got back from vfx the version one of the visual effects shot they had removed all the extras in the background <laughs> and uh, we, were, we were like we we're like it's amazing you can do that but i was like no nah. <laughs> but we don't want we want some back <laughs> we like, please put back three out of four of the extras um anyhow but it, it was like in terms of like there's a lot of like hand healthy that sort of uh energetic camera movement in the show but it, yeah even even so like tracking or moving those those extras we were like we almost like want yeah we just have to applaud them for the shot where they did remove all the extras <laughs> so um yeah no it was great it was, it was great to um have all the pieces and and this was obviously i think every not every you know uh there'll, there'll certainly be um set piece scenes uh and, and this was one where the director um I took took the care and time to uh, gather like uh, a lot of great pieces to work with, and I, I enjoyed it. And I also thought, um, you know, like I mentioned earlier, using using sort of Austin independent music. I think this is one where we had like a just a great song, and like I think I think we kind of like will sometimes dog ear or like um, mark music within the avid in our music bins. Like I was like, this is a cool song. I don't know where I'll use it, but um, it kind of landed right. I think it had like the right kind of pace in the beginning, like building that that sort of anxiety attention as they come in the bank like are we going to do this like um then it kind of built up um uh, in the energy like at the right time mm -hmm. and um yeah it's, it's nice to be able to like feature feature a song like we're, we're this is not a dialogue heavy heist so you know we could actually like, sort of crank up the music at times you sometimes you'll get like a um a dialogue uh, or, or a music a song sorry a song with lyrics that sort of competes with dialogue and other things in the scene you, you end up just kind of like ducking down the music and hiding it a little bit but um but yeah here we could we could kind of crank the music at times and, and let let it let it rock you know so yeah totally so what kind of notes do you get from a from your director um like on a on, on a particular like on this scene and what, what kind of stuff do you get back or do you usually hit what they want or is there a lot of notes that you get back and give us some examples of some of those notes oh well hopefully if i'm doing a good job it's not it's not too many. <laughs> it's not too many. But but no, but I think as editors, or, or I mean myself too, I think we always sort of hold our breath or, or hold us hold ourselves to, <laughs> to a standard. Um, but um, but no, I think that's actually the greatest. Um, uh, you know, you know, I mean, as I'm getting to know a show, you know, like through season one, I think I, I was coming into a new show. You, you're kind of learning the tone, um, uh, uh, learning the best way to um, pace it, the rhythm. 
uh, what the performance is going to be like from the from the main cast um, mm -hmm. and um, discovering that. But but eventually over time, like I, hopefully I'm, I, I can get dialed in enough and also be sensitive to um, uh, responses from the studio network executive producers on previous episodes. Um, so as, as we build in through season one, season two, uh, season three, um, hopefully I'm getting like more attuned to and um, it's a squeeze, but it's like the time to really build the episode to your best of your ability and, and show the director that that you kind of understand uh, what 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 uh, what they were going for in terms of a tone and an action scene, and a dialogue scene, dramatic scene. Um, so anyway, so 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 I, I will put extra attention and, and and kind of build my first assembly, watch it again, uh, try to refine. Um, obviously, like we 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 move quick, but um, I, I do um, think I work longer in the dailies to really really try to um, process the footage. I mean, mentally process the footage to see what the director was going for in places. Uh, confirm that I'm getting the best, you know, performances. And um, yeah, a lot of times the script supervisors notes. That's a great guide, you know, because there, there you kind of see the um, circle selected takes. If the director put in any special notes, um, uh, things to look out for. Um, but um, yeah, most of the time the dire the directors on on Walker are, are in touch with me over the eight days of shooting, and will kind of email me mm -hmm. every day um, things to think about as I'm editing. Um, obviously, I have uh, freedom to build, but um, you know. Um, I've tried to get better about in that first pass. It's a good indication of what the scene can be, and, and so yeah, that's that's sort of the best um, feeling when when you when you send a director or, or uh, our executive producer something, and you know they're like, oh, I just um, you know you you got close, you got in the ballpark of what the scene should feel like. Um, so yeah, I I I, I, I push myself to um, uh, understand what the script requires and and how the how the footage. Um, how the footage speaks to that. So, um, do you review every shot and all the takes, uh, or do you just start with the selects and then find something different if if the selects don't work for you? Um, yeah, I'll definitely like look at the circle take first to kind of see what 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 was sort of uh, agreed upon as like that was the best take. But um, but yeah, yeah, I find a lot of value in in watching, especially with this sort of three camera. Uh, group setup, um, mm -hmm. uh, watching that multi-cam group, because then, then I'll, yeah, I'll totally see something on camera B or C. Well, I think like A or B are usually like more sort of standard, but on our show, I think C cam has a little bit of freedom to sort of float and pan and tilt up around and down. So like, I, I really try to watch and make sure I'm not missing anything interesting that one of the camera operators is doing. Um, and, and also, you know, the, the, uh, the space between the dialogue, um, if there's great reactions or things. So um, I, I try not to, um, oh, I, don't know, I don't know how to say it, but you know, not, not paint by number, not paint line to line. Like I'm definitely like looking and processing at the footage. It, it adds time, but maybe I'll just kind of start my day earlier and, um, and just kind of sit and, and watch um, dailies, you know, um, at least as many of the takes as I can. Um, and it helps that I'm watching in the multi-cam, I'm watching three cameras at once. Um, so, um, yeah, I'll definitely do that. Um, but, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go dig in and, and, um, try to make sure I, I have, I found something that works for the scene. Yeah. How do you find the, like the right rhythm and pace for a scene? Like, it's, is it a feel thing or how, what's the process that you go through to, to get, to hit, hit that rhythm and pace that you want? Oh, well, I guess, um, I, I sort of going off the, um, the format of the show, I think Walker has, um, a particular um, uh, style and, and, and rhythm, and um, that that was kind of established in the pilot uh, by the director and editor on the pilot. Um, so I try to stick to that, and I think um, we we have that sort of. Um, I, I think typically we have that sort of raw, handheld, um, kind of immediate uh, feel in in the footage. So I try to keep that up, and um, we we like to, um, yeah, yeah, drive drive the uh, the stakes and the tension with with uh, you know pretty. Mm, not frenetic editing, but, but you know the way the editing serves uh, the, the crime of the week or, or the uh, uh, the pursuit team might be in. Um, but uh, we can definitely like slow it down, you know, because I think he, the show is a good combination of the action of, of him as a Texas Ranger and, and his his involvement in um, criminal justice versus um, his responsibilities as a family man. So um, you know I, I, the the storylines with him and his his children because he's a single father. Um, I, I, I enjoy those scenes a lot because I think it's like a nice chance for the, the show to slow down and him to really see him really struggling with being a dad. And I think they play those well. Um, and, uh, with his grandparents too, cause he's sort of like co-parenting with his 
oh sorry with his with his parents the children's grandparents but the generations of this walker family all their all their family inner dynamics like uh, I, I enjoy like um those those i really get in and like try to um be sensitive to the performances the the, the um uh, family dynamics and emotions involved um so it's good i think within the course of an, ep an episode we get a chance to do uh some high high intensity scenes some slow down um so i appreciate that that sort of mix of um styles and approaches but yeah i just sort of feel it out um scene to scene um hey, what if you run into like a, a take that you really really like the performance but there's continuity issues between your cuts what do you do you what what do you put as priority um yeah i guess uh sort of the um walter merch of it all right. <laughs> <That> <laughs> yeah, was... yeah 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 no but yeah whatever, whatever feels right it's like because I, I think I, I'm, I, you know, I, I've heard lots of examples or seen lots of demos on YouTube or things where like, and, and like watching some films back, like you, you, you don't like, if it feels like, if it feels like the emotionally correct place to be or the emotionally correct beat, like, uh, yeah, I'll totally forgive that the coffee cup is not in their hand anymore, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or, or, you know, but obviously there, there's tricks and ways to like min minimize the, the continuity differences, right. um, you know, cropping out inconsistencies, um, it's a little bit different sometimes with our handheld footage. We can't really necessarily do too much split screening sometimes. Uh, sometimes it's tra hard to track. Uh, what is it? Second half of the frame. Um, but anyway, th those explain that real quick for those that know the split screening, because we were talking about that way at the beginning before the recording. But uh, yeah, I guess um, if, you, if you're on a show with a sort of a locked off uh, camera on a dolly or a tripod, um, the frame is relatively stable. And it's like easier to kind of, you know, I can just kind of crop out this side of the frame here. And if I don't want you to see my uh, TV back there, um, you know, we could we could do that. And maybe we could replace it with a clean plate of my wall. Um, but um, or or you know, if there's like a, a two a two shot, we could split the frame and uh, kind of reconfigure what actor A and what actor B are doing to make it more, um, you know, the timing better. Or yeah, but um, but yeah, in, in our case, or better performance from one take from the other for uh, different actors. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so then we'll just kind of track the data points in the frame and um, sort of merge those two sides. And, and usually it's quite seamless. We just try to find a good, you know, split point. Um, but yeah, with the handheld, sometimes it gets trickier. Um, but every now and then, and then sometimes we'll just sort of, um, we, in a few instances, we actually did VFX to kind of remove the inconsistency because it, it felt so right. We're like, oh, we got to have this version of the thing, which is like, you know, like a sort of pre- Anyway, anyway, not not to get into AI, but it's like sort of a pre-AI thing where it's like where it's like, oh, we want it to be more like. No, this. we're gonna get into AI. Don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, yeah, no, exactly. So um, uh, yeah, so yeah, so I, I uh, or or you know, like you, you you just get creative, like maybe you cut to reaction shot of some other people like within the scene, you know, uh, heightening the stakes and um, or um, not inserts, but you just kind of kind of uh, cutting to other mm -hmm. things and giving giving some space. But by the time I get back to uh, the actor with the um, continuity issue, like like oh, I kind of forgot about you know, what was going on. Anyway, there's ways to kind of bandage or bandaid. Yeah. Uh, um, but, um, but yeah, no, totally. I just sort of use the, um, what, what feels like the right next emotional place to be, to, to be the guide as much as possible. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. As long as it's not jarring where it just throws you completely out. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you mentioned it, so we're going to go there now with AI. Uh, no, but in general, in technology, Farouk, um, how do you see technology in general, AI part of that, right? But there's so much out there uh, now affecting editing or, or or changing the way you do things. What's what's your take and thought on that? Um, yeah, I, I don't know enough, but I'm, I'm learning more about the kind of upcoming tools. Um, I think within the software, there's already like things and, and um, uh, that have been assisting us along the way. I think like Avid, I don't know if I had it before, but I think Avid over the last five, 10 years added, you know, like syncing based on waveform or- um, mm -hmm. Waveform yeah, those... analysis, right? And yesterday I saw a presentation at the Editor's Lounge where they showed uh, script sync AI. So it uses AI to do transcription. So there, even Avid is introducing AI stuff. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, no, totally. I think over the years, anyway, it's 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 been- Part of our job but like it's ai kind of under the hood and um yeah i, I think if anything if it, if it sh not not necessarily shortens your work day but sort of shifts like your time management like oh, okay well there's a tool with an avid which will do that i don't have to worry about that maybe i can we'll focus on these other creative things because i think both as an assistant editor and as an editor like I, I you know sometimes we want to focus on the creative things but as an assistant editor you're like doing a lot of technical um, management 
uh, media management, um, uh, communication between vendors, I don't know, all the other, the other responsibilities of your role, um, you know, because because sometimes an editor will, will throw something to an assistant editor like, hey, you want to like cut this uh, montage or cut this fight scene. But, you know, anyway, so maybe more, there might be more room to focus on uh, creative uh, um, work. Um, but yeah, I think like hopefully it won't take a huge chunk out of our job. I think just like shift our time. Because I think um, you had shared with me earlier the um, flawless um, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, tech demo. demo. Right. Yeah, yeah, which was um, basically um, altering the face, uh, the, the performance of an actor if you want to change the dialogue. And it'll, it'll change their mouth based on identifying nodes in their face and then reconstructing like a 3D version of their face. Um, that was crazy to like, to, like change dialogue. <laughs> on an actor's performance, which is, which is stuff we like sometimes like puzzle over. We're like, okay, well, well if we want to put in some ADR, we'll just like put it over, uh, over their back on a reaction shot or something. Um, but, um, anyway, so that, that, yeah, totally. I think, um, it'll sort of make our jobs easier and, and, and um, maybe re reduce time. Cause we're sort of like sometimes, um, looking for solutions on, on things. And, and that that's just such a quick and easy way to fix a story point. Um, but also it might, it could also add time, you know, because I mean, I don't think, I think, I think you, well, hopefully it's just sort of like used in a pinch when, especially when, when basically needed, when you're like really need a story fix. I mean, hopefully in, in the early adoption of it, because I think that's also like such a opening a box and such a crazy tool where it, it, it could be tempting to, as writers, as producers to, to be like, okay, well, it's like, oh, now we have the option to rewrite a lot of things mm -hmm. and I'll alter a lot of performance. Like then you, then you're kind of like, um, you know, it could, could could spend a lot of time uh, totally re remanufacturing. Um, right. But um. But yeah. No. Again. So yeah. I, th I think it's all, all good. I'm I'm not against it. Um. If there's ways to, I'm, I'm that um. Uh, AI might maybe it's like assembling, helping us assemble or identify footage. That's good too. But but there's something about um, you know, getting getting your hands and eyes eyes on the footage. My my because I, I don't know. I feel like the editor's assembly is my chance to really like get a sense of the footage, what's there, like, right. Um, you know, even if, I mean, I'm not saying it's, it's happening, but even if an AI could do a initial assembly and then I'm sort of refining it, um, I don't know, that's just guessing, but, uh, you know, for me, I'd still want to do get my hands in, in, in the material and, 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 um, uh, have the feel of an editor's cut. Um, but anyway, but yeah, all that to say is I think it'll make our lives easier in ways we can't expect. Um, but I think, yeah, we were talking about earlier, like it's just a, Maybe a paradigm shift, like when um, Avid came in the picture, or N NLEs, yeah. NLEs, right? Exactly. And it, honestly, any technology, right? From film to digital, another paradigm shift there too, right? And um, so, I mean, it's just it's technology is the way it's it's a double edged sword, right? I mean, you're always it's always going to be good and bad because um, unfortunately that's how humans are. <laughs> We're both good and bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. So, um, so we're pretty close at the end. We're over an hour here, which doesn't feel like that. It uh, definitely feels much shorter. Uh, doesn't feel like a Martin Scorsese movie or anything like that. But... <laughs> okay. I, <laughs> oh, I love, no, I like Martin Scorsese. I love Martin Scorsese. Yeah, no, no, no. I didn't mean, that came out bad. I didn't, they, I didn't mean it as an insult. It's just, I meant that it wasn't long. Anyway. Yeah, no, but yeah, uh, yeah. We'll yeah, actually, his movies are like, yeah, they're, well, they're the long, but three and a half hours, right? <laughs> Which but I haven't, engr I haven't yeah. got the guts yet to uh, to go see and sit through because uh, you tend to use the restroom a lot. But <laughs> I can't pause the button there. Yeah. Um, so what for for new editor or people wanting to get into editing into scripted editing? Um, what should they avoid doing? Yeah, I'd say I don't know. It's depending on the person, but you know, don't don't say no to. They, they, I mean, it's like broad and don't say no to things, but you know, like, or don't say no to opportunities. I mean, but again, that, that's like a personal philosophy. And well, things I that... like that, I, you know, but I like that because, um, one thing I got some slack over is I, a couple of weeks ago, I posted on Facebook, Hey, you know, cause I'm very new to this. Right. And I don't have my portfolio and I'm looking to build it. And, and I said, I want to shoot some stuff or I want to edit some stuff and help you out for free. And I got a whole bunch of people saying, don't do that for free. You're bringing down the entire industry. And I'm like, well, but I have no portfolio and it's a catch 22. Nobody's going to pay right now. So I'm not saying I want to do this forever for free. Right. Uh, but I, I like that philosophy of don't say no. I mean, I kind of like that, but I don't know. Yeah. I guess on the flip side, yeah, it's just like, um, I try to say yes to as much as I, uh, 
as many opportunities as I can it, within reason. I mean, sometimes right. it can, it can um, uh, there's only so much we can kind of do within the workday, but um, uh, yeah, no, I, cause again, I think like I was mentioning earlier, I think I, I learned something new from every um, project, uh, whether it's, um, you know, I've done some documentary shorts and narrative shorts. Um, yeah, every director producing team, like has, has different kind of visions and, and goals for their, their project. And, um, you know, you, you have to kind of usually do a little bit of research, like, oh, what's the best way to kind of achieve this effect or um, manage this type of footage or, um, you know, working, sometimes working closely with the composer from the beginning. I, I don't know. So, so, so uh, yeah, each one adds a, adds a new, uh, you know, asset to your skill set. And uh, yeah, no, I, I mean, I understand maybe that response on, on that public forum or internet forums, but um, yeah, yeah, no, totally. I think um, the sort of low, no pay jobs, if, if that's a choice you, you, you want to make. And, and, and if you know, obviously what you're going to gain from it. Um, I, uh, yeah, I, I endorse, endorse it. That's I, I would... how I saw the the responses that I got that uh, people were saying you're working for free. And I'm like, no, I'm getting paid with lots of, right now I'm getting paid with tons of knowledge, right? Um, of course, I'm not going to do this forever because we all got to pay our bills. I mean, it makes sense. And I don't want to bring down the industry either because I know what I'm worth as just being in the tech industry. I know what my knowledge could be worth. But at the beginning, I think we all have to, I mean, I've done it even in the tech industry where I've done stuff for free, right? Even when I was doing development because I didn't have the experience. Uh, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No, and I think, um, yeah, it, it was sort of my sort of interning, you know, sort of volunteer time and, 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 and uh, years that, that um, yeah, landed me hopefully the um, uh, skills and experience that, um, continue to build on so um yeah i think at some point everybody that that catch 22 it's like um it's hard because it's like oh i want to be a scripted scripted ae or editor but how do i how do i get this experience but it's like you just have to dive in and hopefully the people in your community and collaborators will, will give you those chances and um but yeah you're right it's just like that's like always a weird point in a career i guess there's no smooth way and i, I you know we hear a lot about different editors journeys and there's always like i feel like there's always that's like a common thread hopefully there's one point where they're like well then i just like um you know shadowed an editor or hung around or got the got the chance to like cut some dailies um so hopefully those opportunities keep presenting themselves and um but i, I feel like editors and post-production community is pretty for, for the most part from what i've seen generous with um and accessible um because i don't know we're not i don't know i don't think we're like the rock stars of the uh, uh filmmaking phone pole <laughs> so, <laughs> so if anybody like if anybody wants to like sit down for coffee or, or hang out i'm like let's let's, let's do it <laughs> um yeah well i think that i think editors are rock stars they're just really nice people that are willing to do that and i, I genuinely mean that i mean like every person that I met that's an editor seems really open and really down to earth. I mean, there's a few, but we're, you know, it's just, we're humans, right? So you're always going to run into those few people. But in general, I just, I feel like, um, and I, I'm kind of like, I felt like the same thing with developers when I was in, into development, very open people, very, um, and I don't know, I just, I think it, editors are kind of like that too, because if you think about it, there's a lot of commonalities between developers. I mean, they're both working in a room you know, on their own in the computer, right? I mean, constantly for 12, 13 hours. It just seems like uh, maybe maybe just editors are nice people in general. Yeah, yeah. And hopefully I think we all feel that it's like, um, whether it's creative or technical or kind of avid-based knowledge, I think like, um, yeah, putting it out there. And I, I think the people who, who I've worked closely with along the way who, who've kind of shared stuff and hopefully I'm sharing the same. But um, yeah, we're all kind of building and growing off each other. And yeah, and there's no, I guess there's no, a reason to kind of hang on to the skill set or knowledge because um yeah i think that's the way we all, all kind of grow and obviously there's like a lot of um resources online and right uh, youtube and uh, articles and um but yeah no i think um uh yeah i, I, I can say like for 100 percent like every assistant editor that when i was an assistant editor every assistant mm -hmm. editor i worked with every editor i worked with I, I learned um definitely like a ton of new things from each one because everybody has a different way of handling handling i mean i'm mainly an avid editor now but like everybody has a different way of handling the avid and everybody kind of knows or has different creative techniques within the avid and um yeah i i, I that's one thing i sort of uh, we're, we're still working remotely but that's one thing about i miss about working in an office because you can kind of wander into 
I think like I mentioned earlier, you can kind of wander into another editor's office and mm-hmm. ask them how they're doing things. But it's it's not like um, in a, in a Slack pace. I think I was talking to this talking to some coworkers about this the other day in a Slack pace environment. It's very much about the um, uh, the line item. Like, what what is the question? Like, and here's the response. You know, like it's just like um, task based. It's like the, the, we'll 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 do the minimum minimal amount of conversation. I mean, sometimes more, but the minimal amount of conversation to. Uh, answer a visual effects question or um, a cut question. Um, whereas in the office, we have time to just sort of, um, oh, what are you working on? Oh, I'm, I'm working on this, you know, scene with this, this is truck and like, oh, okay, cool. And like, oh, have you thought about this? And um, right. Um, yeah. And again, that, that sort of just flow of knowledge, it still happens. You know, we have Zoom calls and things, but I think it's different. Well, but there's also that physical communication where, you know, like, okay, Right now, maybe it's not a good time to bother them and ask the question. We're in Slack. You have no clue what's going on on the other end, right? Or maybe they turn around that they are friendlier when you see them. I mean, there's that whole physical communication that you don't see in online that changes everything, I think. Uh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Not, not that it's become impersonal. I mean, I like Slack. I don't like the sound effects on Slack. But um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I, turned, I turned off my sound notifications. They're not. They're not bad. They're they're not bad. Um, <laughs> the sounds are okay. Um, but yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. It's like um, we're we're all more efficient, and maybe our our time is being preserved in a way because uh, we we can be um, hyper efficient with the, the those sort of the channels within Slack and 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 making sure right. that only the person who needs to see the message is getting it. And um, but um, yeah, something's lost. Um, no, I'm sad. Um, <laughs> no, don't be sad. But, but, no, no, but no, I, 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 I like, I like working remotely, and and, and honestly, not that much has been lost. But, but I, I do miss this sort of. So um, you don't go um, in the office at all now? Uh, at least, at least with our, on our show, like we, we, we were presented the option. Um, because season one and two for sure were kind of pandemic years, so right. we were work, we were working remotely. Season three, which we completed before the strike, um, we were given the option. Um, and then season four, we were given the option again to maybe have hmm. edit suites up. Um. But uh, yeah, no, I, I think uh, even though I was sort of griping about working remote, I mean, it was a soft gripe, <laughs> but um, but no, no, I think the comfort of, of working from home and actually I think like my no sort traffic, of, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. That all sort of adds to your mood in a subtle way during the day. And actually, I think I, I sort of my editing has sort of changed. I mean, in a really small way, at least I'm more, feel more comfortable editing dailies from home. You can kind of kind of hmm. re- I don't know, relax and sit with the material a little bit. Um, yeah, it's like that's like sort of an emotional um, connection to the material thing. But yeah, it kind of sitting in, in the in the quiet here, and um, yeah, I, I think I, I sort of approach uh, the way I view dailies a little bit more comfortably at home. So, when you're watching the dailies, and I, we're way over, but it's okay. I'm going to continue here. Uh, when you're watching the dailies, um, do you do you make your own special notes? Do you track them in uh, in Avid as well? Do you put notes in Avid like your own things, or do you mainly go off uh, notes of your director and whatever's on the script? Uh, script notes, um, but sometimes I'll sort of put a kind of an asterisk or, or like um, uh, kind of tag tag within the the clip file name. Maybe I'll or like in the comments column too. I'll kind of remind myself like, oh, there's something in this take that was interesting or, or dropping markers, you know, as I'm watching, if like, I'll mm. kind of drop markers, um, things to remind me. And then, then I can kind of quickly jump to that color marker. And, um, I was like, why was this interesting? Anyway, it might be like a reaction or, a, uh, a moment or something that could be useful somewhere. Um, but, um, yeah, no, I, I think one of my other editing mentors was really good about really like watching. I mean, I know schedules and, 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 um, network TV and streaming TV turnarounds and the amount of footage we're getting, it's all challenging, but, um, as much as possible, if you if we can take the time to watch, um, uh, it, yeah, still still stuff is kind of revealed and in, um, in the viewing. Um, so yeah, so as much as possible, I will I'll mark it up. Yes. Yeah, definitely cool. Uh, well, Farouk, unfortunately, we're out of time. I know we we had your short film. Uh, it's called Sorry, Grandpa Shao, which is uh, I recommend it. I have I think I'm pretty sure I have a link on the description. Not all added. People should watch it. But you do. You, that's what one thing I, I I appreciate that you're doing that you continue doing short films way um, even though you're still you have this great career in in TV scripted so uh, real quick uh, like why are you continuing to do short films is this something you love to do uh, yeah uh, yeah I, I think um, it's like uh, yeah each short film is a different voice different director different writer um, and I like sort of 
learning and, and learning and you know from from them and i think every director has a different approach um again it's like time and each short becomes its own little um uh time commitment but um yeah as much as i can as and as long as people will um uh ask me for my services i'll, I'll try to um but that, that was a great one uh, it was part of the rising voices program uh sponsored by indeed and um sort of co-managed or uh co-produced by uh hillman grad and 271 films um so yeah if there's a link um please check yeah. it out if, that, that. i'll check after if not then i'll definitely add it so people can check it out so they'll be yeah. able to see it there great yeah because that, that was one where the story resonated with me in terms of um culture and holding on to culture and how, who we are as asian americans so that, that kind of resonated with me a lot I, um I'm a, I'm a close friend of the director and um that was an example of um accomplishing some visual effects which i thought were fun on, on a budget mm -hmm. and uh, time constraints so yeah hope yeah you and i think it won right didn't it win um some sort of prize or uh she's uh yeah the director she's gone on to other festivals but yeah it, it was featured as part of that um that tribeca film festival showcase um of short films uh the rising voices premiere um so yeah yeah no that that um that was a recent example of a, a film that um uh matter to me yeah so um uh yeah and and this has been sort of summer of um uh no production because of the strikes so 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 yeah no i was grateful although actually that that was shot just before the strike so it was i think sag uh indie level um but anyway um yeah no no thanks for uh uh noting that and um yeah no i think sh shorts are again are um shorts or any other you know, type of independent content are great ways to kind of keep the skills sharp um yeah what's your future hold where do you see yourself let's say in five years from now five ten years oh like hopefully ultimately where do you want to go uh hopefully still editing um oh, okay <laughs> maybe not in my house maybe in an office um <laughs> who knows i don't know um <laughs> that's the feature or um yeah yeah it's still still tv uh i i, I think uh, but I, i'm open to anything but um I, I i you know being on this show and previous cw experience um i've done some streaming work too as an assistant editor but um yeah i, just, I like the sort of turn around and um the speed of episodes um and, and every every episode it's a new um yeah a new story to tell and um it's nice like blocking them moving on to the next one and um mm -hmm. um I, I sort of like that um excitement or energy from episode to episode but um yeah I, i've done a little bit of independent feature work and um i'm definitely interested in that i just know it's like a bit of a longer haul and um you you, you have more time to sort of um you know uh, look at and and, and uh, test the test the test the film and, and um return to it and um uh yeah again that that, that term it's uh, iterative you can do many versions and um uh yeah that that's sort of a longer i guess incubating process for the baby but um also, also rewarding when um, on on those uh, the chances I've done. But yeah, I, I'm I'm hopeful there will be continuing to be um, opportunities in television. To uh, yeah, that's awesome. All right, Farouk, thank you so much, man. If people want to get hold of you, the Instagram right there is the best way. Uh, yeah, yeah. For, for now, yeah, you can definitely message me there. And um, you're on LinkedIn too. I think we're connected on LinkedIn. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Any of those, and um, yeah, if I can be of help or if um any, anybody wants to chat I, i'm around and uh, yeah thanks for um giving me a chance to be part of your your podcast because uh, yeah i've been listening to your episodes and um I'm, I'm getting a lot gaining a lot from them so oh cool i'm glad to hear that and thank you for being part of it i really really appreciate it yeah for sure i hope you enjoyed this episode of the transitioning to filmmaking podcast remember if you're watching this on youtube please subscribe to my channel, click that bell icon to get notified when a new episode is out. And if you enjoyed this episode, hit that like button. If you didn't, send me an email, marcelo at creativespark.ai and tell me why. Finally, remember to visit my site, creativespark.ai for more podcast episodes, tutorials, and to read my daily journal where I post how my transition to filmmaking is going. Until the next one, cheers.